Let us pray. Speak, Lord, speak a word. Speak a word of truth. Speak a word of power. Speak a word of welcome. Speak, Lord, for your people are listening. Amen. Dinner time! It's one of my favorite times as a kid. Well, I would love to hear the words, come on, it's time for supper. And I'd go running into the dining room and crawl up onto the wood chair and wait for mom or dad to push me into the table. Well, we, my four, my four sisters and I, had to stay at the table until our plates were cleaned, right? <laughs> until dinner was over. And the way that my dad ensured that would happen is instead of having just two captain's chairs with the arms on the side, he bought all captain's chairs <laughs> so that when we were pushed in, we had to stay at the table. Well, as an adult, I have found myself using this phrase, stay at the table, more than just at dinner time, but also during different times in the church. When an elder at a church I was called to serve found out that I was a woman, he was very disappointed. Until he got to know me as a person and as a pastor. But until that time, the clerk of session told me later that she had to say to him, just wait and stay at the table. When an elder, when I was serving another church, an elder walked out of a session meeting when we began to talk about welcoming gays and lesbians into the church. So I went after him, and I invited him to come back into the conversation, that we needed his voice. I invited him to come back and stay at the table. In another church I served, there was a church member who found out that we were going to put Black Lives Matter signs on the front yard, and he was not happy and was going to leave. And so I invited him into a conversation, and we had a wonderful long walk and talk. And then at the end of that conversation, before I could say anything, he said, I know what you're going to say. Stay at the table. And so I will. Stay at the table with people you don't know, don't like, don't understand, who are different than you are. It's my invitation to how we form Christian community. It's what love does. But stay at the table is a good invitation, but it makes an assumption, doesn't it? It assumes that we have a place at the table that we can choose to leave at will. But what about the people who don't have a place at the table? That's what Jesus' parable in Luke 14 is about today. It's not about assuming that you have a place of honor and then have to be asked to move down at the table. Jesus says, for all who are exalted will be humbled, and all who are humbled will be exalted. And it's not about assuming that we know who is going to be invited and assume that we are among the invited, right? Jesus says, go out into the streets and invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. Why them? Well, at the time, they were the outcasts, the ones that nobody else wanted to be around. And so the parable that Jesus tells invites us to practice humility for ourselves, right? And hospitality for others, especially those unlike us. The parable answers the question, what is the kingdom of heaven like? And the answer, it's a great banquet to which all are invited, even the outcasts are welcome and made to feel like guests of honor. Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. It's a beautiful picture of the kingdom of heaven, isn't it? But here's the thing. Jesus didn't just come to paint beautiful pictures of heaven. He came to make God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. 
and he needs our help to do that. So as followers and disciples of Jesus, Jesus calls us to help make that vision a reality. How? Well, by not just inviting privileged people like ourselves to the table, but enlarging the table to include people who aren't here. Our church's invitation is come just as you are. And that's a really good start. But we can't just invite people to come to us. We have to go to them. In a church that I once served, there was a little girl named Barbara. She was five years old. And she was very interested in communion. And so she began to ask about having her first communion. So after talking with her and her mother, we agreed that she was ready. So I'll never forget that day when she came up and her eyes were full of wonder as I put that piece of bread in her little hands and said, the body of Christ given for you. So after the service, I gave Barbara the other half of the bread that we hadn't used in communion, and she ran off as happy as can be to go to a picnic with her mom and her little brother. I received a very surprising email later that afternoon from her mother telling me how their picnic went. Apparently on her own accord, Barbara took this communion bread and walked around the park to everybody and said, the body of Christ given for you, the body of Christ given for you, the body of Christ given for you. At the tender age of five, perhaps Barbara better understood this parable of the great banquet. And that is, that it's not just a story to be read, but to be lived. It's not just staying at the table. It's enlarging the table so that all can eat and be fed. And so that's what we do. When we take dinners to the men's shelter, we feed the hungry. When we give coats to the North Hills Community Outreach, we clothe the poor. When we deliver meals on wheels, we visit the lonely. When we speak up and stand up for people who have no voice, no name, no place at the table. We bring Christ to our community when we go out into the world and we share the word of God, the love of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit through our actions. And in doing so, we enlarge the table so that all are welcome, all are included, all can be together at the table as God's beloved children. Well, the Christian call to welcome outcasts seems pretty clear in the gospel. I mean, Jesus is pretty clear about this, right? But often in our world today, politics cloud what we're supposed to do, right? So we saw this played out recently in Martha's Vineyard where Florida Governor Ron DeSantis sent 50 refugees seeking asylum. In a recent Washington Post article, Nicholas Pruitt wrote this. During the late 1940s and 50s, as people were fleeing war-torn Europe, a curious demographic of Americans offered assistance. Protestant Christians. <laughs> Despite a long history of anti-immigrant sentiment and cultural gatekeeping, these Americans pooled local and denominational resources to sponsor refugees following World War II and the Cold War. Protestant organizations such as Church World Service marshaled significant fundraising and publicity to rally Christians to support refugees. Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Congregationalists, Baptists, Methodists, and many other Protestant, Protestants used denominational channels to sponsor refugee resettlement. With this history in mind, Pruitt writes, it should come as no surprise that the Center of Assistance for Asylum Seekers that last week on Martha's Vineyard was St. Andrew's Episcopal Church. 
And he says, politicians continue to use immigrants as political pawns and relocate them to different parts of the country. Christian churches across the nation will need to draw from their history and work to more fully embody the words of Jesus Christ, to love thy neighbor as thyself in their local communities. Enlarging the table in many different ways. In 1933, Shadyside Presbyterian Church right here in Pittsburgh, their pastor Hugh Kerr, decided that we needed a way to help show the public that Christians actually were united in something and not just divided all the time, right? And so he started something called World Communion Sunday, the first Sunday of October, when people from all around the country, all around the church, would celebrate their unity in Christ at the table. Well, in 1936, the National Church approved this. 1940, it was approved by the World Council of Churches, and it went out to the whole world to invite everybody to mark this day. And so we do today, World Communion Sunday, 2022. We join our sisters and brothers from all over the world for praying that the vision that Christians might be united as one in Christ might actually become a reality. And we, in this church, we work together to help make Jesus' parable of the great, great banquet, where all are included and all are welcome, to become a reality. So in my vision of the kingdom of heaven, I know we all have one, so I, my vision is that we're all gathered together with the saints and the redeemed sinners at an endless banquet table, right? And everyone has a captain's chair <laughs> so that we can't get away until everyone is fed. We stay at the table. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, we get a foretaste of what the heavenly banquet will be here and now. Dinner time. Come on. The Lord's Supper is ready. Come to God's great banquet. Let God feed your hungry heart with the bread of life. Let God fill your thirsty spirit with the cup of salvation. At God's table, there is room enough, there is food enough, there is grace enough for all, and even enough to share. May it be so. Mm -hmm. Amen. And now during this time of silence, um, we're going to see a couple slides. This is a mural that was created by artist Hyatt Moore. And it's based on the Luke 14 parable. And you'll get a sense of what he was trying to um, communicate. And these are actually, many of them are real people that he painted at this table. <laughs> 